Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. I'm going to show you in the next few moments that of all the furniture of Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple, the only one that conceals very heavy future prophetic mysteries is the menorah. Every piece of furniture can point to Christ, but this one points to things that have not yet happened. And before it's over with on, in this message, I'm going to show you it prophetically tells us where we are now in prophecy. And that may be one of the most fascinating things that we're going to get to somewhere in this message today. Now, the menorah, according to Jewish tradition, is a picture of the tree of life. Now, there are different ideas as to, we all know it had tripod legs in the beginning. It was pure gold, 24 karat gold. But the question has risen about the arms because there's two beliefs concerning the arms. So one belief, and this is the model I have on the platform, is a curved arm. They curve. And the other one is uh, the model that we call the straight. Mahamanides did the one on the left and said it was straight branches going out. Now recently, I don't know if you're aware of this, but they found in Jerusalem a piece of jewelry with the menorah on it and they found it Bob 25 feet away from where I tape with my people on the Hulda steps buried six inches under the ground can you believe that if only I'd have had a metal detector no metal detectors are illegal for people so I wouldn't have done that but I, I, I've always said that they were having difficulty at the Temple Institute trying to create a gold menorah because the 24 karat gold is soft and these branches would get heavy and kept flopping you know what I told them I said watch and see one day if you don't discover that there was a rod running right across the top here holding them all together. Guess what? On the menorah jewelry that they just found, they have a rod that's running from here to here, here to here. It was very simple. They even brought people from Boeing in trying to figure out how to keep those branches from sagging. And all along, Perry Stone had the revelation. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> And really, it was, it was very simple when you look at it, how they could have kept the branches from sagging. And I'm, I'm cutting up with you on having that revelation, but yet it's true I did say that. Now, the, the, tree, the tree of life was the tree that was in the Garden of Eden, if you remember, that when Adam and Eve would partake of the tree, it kept them enlightened to the things of God, and it also kept them full of life and full of vigor and health. They would have never died had they continued to live from the tree of life, if you'll check it out in your scripture. Now, in 2500 B.C., See, there was a cylinder that was made, and, and it shows two people, a woman and a snake behind her at the tree of life. There's another tree that is in the ground, and in this particular uh, imagery that again is 2500 BC which would actually be in the neighborhood of 4500 years old that there, it, it also shows a rod in the ground and there is something blossoming out of this rod that looks like flowers and on it it looks like now this is interesting palm granites now the reason palm granites on that right picture are significant on that is scholars indicate that that is a replica of the tree of life. No one knows what type of fruit was on the tree. The book of Revelation says that the tree of life bears 12 manner of fruit every month. It's in your Bible. We're assuming that that's the way it was in the Garden of Eden. However, notice the pomegranates. Now, why is that important to understand? The pomegranate, if you've ever seen one, the end of it has a natural crown at the, at the very end. It is red in color, and the Jews have 613 D Deeds based on the five books of Moses that they are to do, commandments and instruction. And they tell me, I tried to count it one time, and I can't count it for eating them, but I opened up one a couple times with my little girl. We tried to count. The Jews teach in a mature pomegranate, there's 613 seeds representing the 613 deeds. We do know that at the temple, when you would go in the temple of Solomon, that there were two posts, and on top of those posts were two carved pomegranates. We also know at the base of the high priest's garment, there were pomegranates made of blue and a bell and blue and a bell and they went all underneath the garment so it is the holiest fruit in Israel and I'm not telling you that the pomegranate is the tree of life I will tell uh, is, was on the tree of life may have been I don't know about that but I'm saying to you that the old imagery shows a fruit very similar to that on the frescoes and the cylinders that have been found in the area of Iraq ancient Samaria and places of that nature so in other words if you look at this and you begin to talk about it the menorah for some reason represents according to 
the ancient Jewish belief, the actual tree of life. I want you to keep that in mind because that comes into play a little bit later on. Now, the tree of life, as I said earlier, based on Revelation 22.2, had 12 types of fruit on it. Why is that important? Because in the temple that was built for God to come down in the Holy of Holies and meet with the high priest, there were exactly 12 different types of sacred vessels. I'm going to give you the list right here. First of all, there was the brass altar. Then there was the laver. There was the table of shoe bread, the menorah, the golden altar, the Ark of the Covenant. This was all the sacred furniture. But a part of the furniture was the mercy seat, which was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that had two gold cherubs on top of it. And then you had, in, in Moses' day, the tablets of the law. Then you also had basins that were used for offerings. For example, a brass basin to carry the ashes out. You also had a veil that was embroidered with cherubim. That was considered holy. You had gold and silver shovels. You had knives used for sacrifices. And you had vessels to remove the ashes and to clean the menorah with. Now, in other words, how interesting is it that if this, if this represents the tree of life, the tree of life had 12 kind of fruit, Revelation 22, and there's 12 specific sacred pieces of furniture and sacred vessels that would have been used in the tabernacle of Moses and also would have been used in the temple of Solomon. Now, as we go on in this, let me remind you of something, that all of the vessels and all of the sacred furniture was about one thing. It was about God bringing life to his people. It was all about life. The only death at the tabernacle and at the temple were the sacrifices and the offerings that were being made, which was a picture of Christ. The, who would be the ultimate sacrifice. So keep in mind that these are all pictures and patterns. Now, as we continue, Moses had a revelation in the wilderness. Now, notice this. And there are six distinct pieces of sacred furniture that are both in the tabernacle of Moses and were also in the temple of Solomon. And let's look at these again closer. We have the brass altar up in the upper left. We have in the center the laver, which in Solomon's day had 3,000 baths of water. 3,000, the, the easiest way for me to explain this is like saying 3,000 gallons of water. That gives you at least an idea. Then you had the 24 karat gold brass, uh, I'm sorry, golden menorah. You had the table of shoe bread at the bottom left hand corner, which had 12 different types of bread. You had the golden altar, which was made of shittim wood or incorruptible wood as it's called, overlaid with, with, with gold with four horns on top of it. Then you have the golden ark of the covenant, the rectangular box with the mercy seat where the priest would go into the holy of holies once a year on the east side of the ark and he would sprinkle the sacrificial blood on the ark once a year on the day of atonement making atonement for mankind now these six pieces of furniture are very significant because six is what number in the bible talk to me somebody you ought to know by now six is the number of man and it's the number of mankind so everything about this altar you would do your sacrifices on the brass altar you would wash at the labor your hands sanctifying yourself you would then go in and you could you could receive the illumination at the menorah and then you'd eat from the bread of the table of two shoe bread. You would pray your prayers at the golden altar. And then the Ark of the Covenant was where you finally came and communicated with God. And the priest would come down and communicate with God. All of this approach was simply about mankind approaching God. Because the brass altar represents your salvation. The, the labor represents your water baptism. Hey, hey. The seven branch candlestick represents the seven manifestations of God's spirit in your life. The table of shoe bread represents the 12 doctrines of the New Testament because there's 12 main doctrines. And there on the golden altar, there was 11 types of incense that represented prayers going up to God. And there's 11 different types of prayer in the New Testament. And the Ark of the Covenant had the tablets of the law. It had the manna and the rod. And the tablets represent your salvation. Mm, yeah, well, 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 help me, Jesus. The, man, the, manna represents your, the manna represents your salvation. The tablets represent your sanctification. And the rod had the power of God in it. That represents the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it's all inside the ark. So in other words, six pieces of furniture gave man approach back to God. Now if we keep looking at this, the menorah, however, is significant. This menorah right here that I'm standing in front of is significant because this, again, this menorah is prophetic. It deals with prophecy. It deals with the idea of biblical 
biblical prophecy and what the future has to hold. So let us look right now at the menorah or the candlestick and let's see how it reveals the plan of God. How does the menorah reveal the plan of God? First of all, I'm going to give you the details in making the menorah and the spiritual application. First of all, the menorah was made of one piece of gold that represents the unity of the faith and the church. We are to be one. The menorah had three knobs. That represents the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The menorah had seven lamps. These are the seven manifestations of the Spirit of God mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 4. The menorah had nine ornaments, three knobs, three flowers, bowls, and nine. These represent the nine fruit of the Spirit. Praise God. The menorah had 12 symbols representing the divine government of the 12 apostles, Mark chapter 13, verse 4. The menorah had 22 flower cup designs representing the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The menorah had a total of 66 ornaments representing the 66 books in the Bible. And the menorah had three legs that the foundation was based on representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Somebody tell me the menorah is not a prophetic piece of furniture. Now, let's go over here because in the menorah, there's seven branches on it. There's seven distinct branches on the menorah. Now, when you look at the menorah and you look at the seven branches, what do they represent? Now, I'm going to show you what I see in this. I see the first three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But how many of you know how many mothers there were? Four. There were four mothers. Can anybody name them? Sarah. Listen, I feel like I'm in Sunday school class again. Can anybody name who they are? Who are the four mothers? Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Rebecca. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Rebecca. They formed the entire nation of Israel. It was through their womb or through the seed of those men, the entire nation of Israel came into existence. So the menorah having seven lamps represents the seven founders of the faith and the seven founders of the Jewish faith and the seven founders of Israel who brought the light of God's Word originally through the Torah and the prophets and now through the apostles in Christ to the, the world. Now on top, as I mentioned earlier, and I want to show you, uh, I think I may actually have a picture of this one and not just go to the menorah. I'm not sure if we have that or not. But one of the things, I, no, we don't have that. One of the things I want to show you is the top part of this was in the shape of an almond. And most of you know an almond also is kind of the shape of your tongue. It starts out wide and narrows toward the back. And these three pointed toward the center one, and these three, the opening where the wick was, pointed toward the center one. So everything on the menorah, as we're going to tell you about tonight, centered on the central shaft. Now let me give you a nugget. The Bible tells you that when Moses, or when they made this, when Moses instructed them to make the menorah, it says it was to be beaten beaten out of gold. You can take a one ounce gold coin and, and actually begin to beat it if you have the pressure and it will be larger than what I, what I, than right up here where I'm standing on this. In fact, I don't even want to tell you how big one ounce gold can be if you beat it out and flatten it out and get it super, super thin. The, the numbers I've even read about are even hard for me to believe. But here's the point I want to make. Beaten, you shall beat the gold to make the menorah. Beaten is from the Hebrew word, root word for the word difficult. Difficult. So in other words, in the beating process, the root word is difficult, indicating this is not going to be an easy piece of furniture to make. Now think about it. Except for the labor, everything else is make a wooden box, put gold over it. This, how do you make this thing out of one piece of beaten gold? You tell me, specialists in Israel and rabbis to this day cannot even tell you how did he roll it, how did he get it all together. It's almost an impossibility. It has to take a divine revelation of God. But here's the part that I really want to get to. Hey, hey, hey. Everything up till now has just been a little bit of an introduction. But I saw this one day and it stunned me because if you read Exodus chapter 30, he's listing, God is listing for Moses uh, all the sacred furniture that he's going to build. And he says, build me an ark and God calls it an it. Then he says, build me a veil, and God calls it a it. Then he says, I want you to make atonement, and he calls it it. And he says, now build me a labor, and he calls it a it. He said, put oil in it, and he calls it it. Then he gets to the candlestick and calls it his. Exodus chapter 30, verse 37. He calls it 
him in Exodus 25, 31 through 37. Now, why does God in the beginning call every piece of furniture an it, which is neuter? Now, what I mean by neuter, neuter sounds funny today, especially when you talk to people who have dogs. They can't get the image of what you're talking about when you say something's neuter. But let me talk to you about languages for a minute. He or him is masculine. She or her is feminine. And it is neuter, meaning it is not either feminine, it is not masculine. It, we, we would say the carpet. We wouldn't say, oh, look at that pretty carpet. Isn't she pretty or isn't he pretty? We'd say, isn't it pretty because it's neither male nor female. So in other words, God calls the furniture neither male nor female. But when God himself gets to the menorah, he uses the word his, his candlestick, his branches. Why does God change it from it to him? And then all of a sudden, later on in Exodus, God begins to call all of the furniture his. Here's the reason why. Praise God, because this is the piece of furniture. No other piece of furniture in the tabernacle specifically represents a member of the Godhead. It's a type and shadow of Jesus. It is a picture of Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Revelation, this represents the Holy Spirit. This represents seven churches. And because of that, God changes the name in the very beginning of the menorah from calling it a it to calling it his or him because he understood something that the Holy Spirit is not a it that my father help me now the Holy Spirit is a him the Holy Spirit is a person throughout the Bible when the Holy Spirit is identified he's identified when he the Spirit of truth shall come and when he shall pray through you and he the Holy Spirit so God understood he will never call the Holy Spirit the member of the Godhead a it and Pentecostals years ago we've done this all the time we've done it now we don't mean it we don't mean it we don't do it on purpose but we'd say, I'll tell you what, he sure got it tonight, didn't he? And we would talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And many times, and God got to dealing with me a couple years ago and said, quit calling me a it because I'm not a it. I am that I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I would say they receive the gift tonight. They receive the anointing tonight. They receive the manifestation of God tonight. Now, let's go over a little study. I think you'll find this interesting as we continue. There were two temples that existed, one was the temple of Solomon that existed back in the time of King Solomon that was destroyed later by the Babylonians. And the other one was one that was rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah after the Babylonian captivity when the Jews returned. They were both built upon a mountain called Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah, as you know, is today where the El Aska Mosque and the Dome of the Rock sit in the city of Jerusalem. But it's believed to be that the top of Mount Moriah is actually in the vicinity where the Islamic Mosque sits. Now, the Hebrew, the Hebrew name of this mountain in Genesis 22.1 and 2 Chronicles where Solomon built the temple is called Mount Moriah. It is also referred to in Song of Solomon 4.6 by the metaphor of the mountain of myrrh. Now myrrh is interesting because it's mentioned 11 times in the Bible more than any other plant and it's mentioned 7 times in the Song of Solomon. Now why would this mountain by Solomon be called the mountain of myrrh? It's called Mount Moriah, yes, but the mountain of myrrh because myrrh comes from the Hebrew word more, which means to be bitter. Uh, myrrh is found in Exodus chapter 30, 23 through 25. It's mentioned as one of the first ingredients that goes into the anointing oil. Let's stop right there. So why does God allow a bitter type of, uh, of, of substance, a myrrh, to go into the anointing oil? Why would the root word myrrh mean bitter, and why would they relate that to the mountain of myrrh there on top of the temple? Mount, because I want to tell you something. It's glorious to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, but there's also sometimes people who become bitter because you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. When David was anointed in the midst of his brethren, instead of them rejoicing because he's anointed, they became jealous of him in the midst of his anointing. And David had to carry a heavy burden with his brothers and a heavy burden with his family because of the anointing that God had given him. Therefore, there's a sweetness to the things of God, but in the anointing oil was a substance that God said, when I pour it over your head, oh, that oil sure does smell sweet.
sweet with the smith cinnamon. Cinnamon smells good. I'm telling you, I like the smell of cinnamon. I like it on food. I like to eat it. You know what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, there's a little bit of myrrh in that anointing as well, that everything's not always sweet. Ministry is not always easy. Dealing with people is not always fun. Dealing with people with devils is really not even fun. And so what I'm saying to you is the mountain of Moriah being a place of God's glory is also a place that Solomon understood at times you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be misquoted. You're going to have people turn against you. It's not always going to be cinnamon when you're in the ministry. I wish I could get an amen from some preachers sitting out there right now. <laughs> now, the name Moriah is interesting because there is a plant that grows on the Temple Mount. You don't see it now because of the stones, but it grows in Jerusalem called the Moray plant. And oh, how interesting that this plant looks similar to a menorah. Some suggest that this may be why the mountain took its name based on a plant similar to this. The interesting thing about this little plant is if you squeeze, you have to squeeze it, and when you squeeze it, you get a fragrance out of it. Oh, I could preach right there if you don't mind somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go a little step further. In 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, Solomon made ten candlesticks of gold according uh, to their form and set them in the temple, five on the right hand and five on the left, he also made ten tables and placed them in the temple, five on the right and five on the left, and he made up a hundred basins of gold. This is real odd. Why would Solomon, because the, the, the word of God commanded there to be one menorah that would be in the holy place and the priest would minister there every day. So why does Solomon go and make ten smaller ones and put some five on one table, five on the other table as you're coming into the holy place? Well, there's different theories as to why he did this. However, it was a prediction that had been made by a prophet that ten of the tribes would go into captivity. And so there is a theory, and I suggest to you that this is only a theory that perhaps Solomon realized by the wisdom of God that one day that the tribes would go to captivity. He made one menorah so every tribe could take one menorah with them as they go into captivity but leave the one main menorah in the temple back in, his, uh, in the time of Solomon. Of course, he had the, the six-foot one that we're talking about. So that's a suggestion as to why. Perry Stone is now making available the audio CDs and DVDs from this year's main event. You too can experience the same life-changing revelations from the Word of God, just as the thousands who attended did when you see and hear the nine messages from the 2013 main event conference. Perry's illustrated sermon, Living the Life of a Four-Faced Christian, What a Cherub Can Teach You About Walking with God, was the most requested message in the 36-year history of the ministry. Using the golden menorah, Perry reveals where we are living in prophetic time in his sermon, Prophetic Mysteries Concealed in the Menorah. Everyone must hear the insights on how Satan attempts to rewire your brain during temptation and how temptation releases chemical responses and impacts the spirit, heart, and brain. In Perry's message, What Happened to My Brain When the Tempter Came? Also hear the stunning prophetic message as Perry released a warning for America and its leaders in his sermon, Gambling with Israel's Covenant. Perry also explains the dueling prophecies of the three end-time religions in the dynamic expose when crescents, crosses, and stars collide. See biblical proof that Christ is the Messiah and discover how the recent uprisings in the Middle East are a part of Islamic expectations and prophecies to unite a final Islamic kingdom. On the DVD, you will be able to see pictures of the three unusual apparitions that have stirred the Middle East into its present condition. You will enjoy these five new messages by Perry, as well as four powerful messages by other anointed speakers. Tony Scott's revelation on the kingdom ignited a new motivation in the attendees. Tommy Bates delivered a right now word, as did Mark Casto. People were unable to remain in their seats as Randy Caldwell preached the house down in his message, he's the best I have ever seen. You may order by calling 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. 
or online at perrystone.org. Request offer number 13ME-CD for the CD set or 13ME-DVD for the DVD set. You may also write to Perry Stone, Post Office Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. The nine CDs are for a donation of $55 or more, and the nine DVDs are for a donation of $95 or more. The CDs are the messages only, but the DVDs have the messages and the pictures Perry used for illustrations as well as powerful praise and worship music. And by ordering, your support helps keep Manifest on the air. We look forward to hearing from you soon. I hope that you can get the entire message that's coming with this series plus the other eight messages. We believe they will be a great help in your spiritual knowledge. You know, we're coming toward the end of another year and there's been a lot of things happen this year, a lot of good things and sometimes in the nation or globally some really tough things and rough things have happened for people in different nations and individuals. But we want you to know that we have a, a prayer team that pray for your needs, that call on the Lord on your behalf, especially on Thursdays at our prayer morning. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to keep building a prayer movement here in Cleveland, Tennessee and we're already seeing people. We've had several people that have contacted us that the cancer that they had was beginning to go away and some of the other problems, family problems were beginning to dissipate and God was beginning to answer prayer. And we're just going to believe with you. We want you to know that we're going to stand with you all the way through this next year of 2014 and believe God for great things. Now, speaking of great things, there's going to be some great things happening right in Cleveland, Tennessee. Let me give you this real quick. On January the 17th through the 19th is our first Reformation Movement, Friday through Sunday with Eddie James, Jay Hamilton, and uh, just a number of other praise and worship leaders is going to be there. We're going to have a great, great outpouring of the Spirit. And then I want you to mark Warrior Fest for March 28th through the 30th. This is our major youth conference, youth and college and career. And a lot of parents are going to be bringing their young people to this. And we've got Jake Hamilton coming, Eddie James. We've got uh, Damon Thompson, myself, Mark Casto, and a lot of praise and worship teams. Plus, there's a God Has Talent competition going on there. Plus, we're giving away a car at the Warrior Fest. You can go online and find out more information about that. And then we also have our great prophetic conference, which is coming up in the month of October. I'm sorry, month of April, 20 24th through the 27th. Jonathan Kahn, who wrote The Harbinger, is coming to Cleveland, Tennessee, going to open up the conference that Thursday. Bill Cloud, Donald Perkins, myself, we're going to have a great conference. And what I'd like for you to do is go to perrystone.org and look at the other places we're going to be coming to, like Tampa, Florida, January 24th through the 26th, Metro Church of God, Birmingham, Alabama, February 7th through the 9th, and uh, Free Chapel Worship Center, Orange County, February 21 through 23. Just want to let you know that we are coming to these areas. We'd love to have you to come and help participate in them and be a part. One of the ways that we keep up with people around the world or we ask people to keep up with what we're doing is through uh, perrystone.org. Now, one of the things that we do is we have what's called a Pam's Corner. My wife writes a special corner for that. We have also a prophetic update. Uh, some of our, uh, we have some great writers here on staff, some young people that are just extraordinary writers and researchers, and they will, have, uh, you know, bring special messages from time to time because we believe, you know, it's so amazing. I and mean, when you stop and think about it, the entire world right now can be connected through satellite television, like some of you right now are watching us on a, a cable network or a satellite network, but also you can watch manifest through most of the stations on your computer. And now they're even making it where you can carry a phone and watch it on the telephone. And honestly, you don't know where technology is going to end. Somebody told me that it doubles every so many months, and I believe it does. But uh, we're excited to be alive today, and we're going to do everything we can to bless you, minister to you, and also reach your family members and your kids and your sons and daughters and granddaughters for the kingdom of God in these special events that we're going to have coming up here and also throughout the U.S. But uh, we always uh, take a moment and say, if you do not have a, redemption, a redemptive covenant, through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted Him and asked Him to cleanse you by His blood, forgive you of your sins, you must do so. That is the guarantee of entering heaven, entering the kingdom of God, is through the redemptive covenant of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'll turn your heart to Him now and become a believer. God bless you till next week.